In this video, we're going to look at the standard shader, and we're going to look at how the material properties we talked about in the real world, um, things like the diffuse color, reflectivity, the Fresnel effect, we're going to talk about how we can do those with the standard shader in Unity. And so in this project, under the materials folder, I have a materials scene. And in this scene, I have a sphere and a cube. And for the moment, I'm just going to turn the cube off. And I've created a test material to start. Now we need to make sure that our test material is assigned into the scene so that we can work with it. And then we can click on the test material and we can see the various parameters and things that we can set. And we're going to be going through this list from top to bottom. So we're going to start with albedo. And albedo is um, what we've discussed re previously as the diffuse color. Um, and so this is sort of the base color of our object, uh, and it starts as white. Uh, it's also kind of a multiplier. So other things like um, the, the metallic properties will be multiplied against this base albedo color. Um, and over on the right here, we can apply a tint. So for instance, if I click on that, I can make my, um, my sphere tinted red to start. Now we can also apply a texture. And so at the bottom, I have this bricks diffuse texture. And if I apply that under the albedo, we call this the albedo channel, then we'll see that I have the bricks now are the base color of this object. And we're gonna, still going to see the other effects on top. So you can still see that specular effect on top of the bricks. So again, this is just a base coloring that everything else is kind of multiplied against. So I'm just going to get rid of the albedo. And we're going to look at things sort of one by one in isolation to start. And the next thing uh, is going to be this metallic and smoothness section. And this describes basically how metallic an object is. And again, we have values over on the right, and we can apply a texture over on the left. And the metallicity can go from 0 to 1. And so in this scene, take a look at that sphere as I start moving from left to right. So this describes how metallic how like a metal object versus how non-metallic, how like a, uh, a ceramic or a wood or a non-metallic object something is. And then we also describe how smooth that thing is. And again, watch as I travel on the left from zero to where I have no reflections at all, over to the right where I'm almost perfectly reflecting the background. Now, at this point, I'm going to flip over to the Unity reference, and the link to this page will be next to the video. And they have a great section on each of these material parameters that we're going to cover. So I definitely encourage you to read through, and it'll be a much more in-depth view of these things that I'm going to be giving you. So we're going to start past the albedo color, and we are going to look at the metallicity of an object. and. Uh, these parameters that we have, um, metallicity and smoothness, again, you know, we can verify these uh, if we pop back over to Unity, metallicity and smoothness, um, you can see that they have this handy chart telling you what kinds of objects in the real world have these material properties. Um, so on one hand we have the metallicity, and on the other hand we have the smoothness. And so if you're ever curious, you can take a look at this reference, and if we're trying to create a glossy plastic, then we know kind of where to aim for. Uh, and you can also actually look at what physically hap is happening with the smoothness, for instance, of an object, how light is being reflected, if you're curious to, to learn a bit more. So uh, as a quick aside here, we actually, under the standard shader, we have two sort of modes that we can work with. Right now we're in the metal mode. If you go up to the shader drop-down at the very top, and you select the other standard, which is standard specular setup, then you'll see that the only thing that changes is this value right here. So I'll change that again. We have metallic and smoothness, and we have specular and smoothness. Now, these do basically the same thing, um, but artists are used to thinking about materials in different ways, and artists are often the ones that are creating materials for games. So specular is sort of, how shiny is this object? while metallicity is how metal-like is this object. Uh, you can work in either one as you like, whichever one you're more comfortable with. Um, and again, the, the documentation will give you a, a big leg up. And if you go down to this materials, materials charts page, 
then they have very handy charts that talk both about metallicity and about specular and how we can use these different workflows to create different types of materials. So in the end, we can accomplish things either way. It's really just how you like to think about things. Do you like to think about how shiny something is, or do you like to think about how metal-like it is? So next, I'm going to pop back to the standard shader. Um, so next in our list is the normal map and the height map. And these are fairly related concepts. Um, so a normal map essentially defines um, some added detail for um, essentially the surface of an object. And the easiest way is just to show you this thing. So I have a texture called bricks normal. And if I apply that to the normal map, then we'll see that what we've created is this extra bumpiness. And we haven't actually changed our object as, at all. We're simply doing this with a texture. So if I add back that diffuse, then we'll see that we have a, a nice, and we set this um, very high on smoothness, so a nice metal looking brick. I'm going to actually set this way back down so our bricks are no longer metal. But we'll see that we have this nice brick, and it actually appears to have more detail in terms of height than it really does. And one way that we can see this is if we take our sphere and we rotate it, then we'll see, and if you watch any of these bricks as we move around, you'll see that they'll actually respond to the light in the scene, so the shadows will move. So that's a very cool way that just by adding a texture we can get extra detail on an object. And if we pop back over to our test material, um, the, the height map does a similar thing, but it actually uh, it does something called a parallax effect, and it actually instead of only affecting the lighting, it actually makes it appear that things are deeper into the object or further out of the object. And again, this is a weird thing to wrap your head around, so I'll just show you rather than telling you. So if we drag this bricks bump onto the height map, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the bricks here. As we drag this uh, multiplier for our channel, we're going to see that things actually appear to move in and out of the material. And so it's doing just some sort of computational trickery to make it appear that our object has more depth than it actually does. So again, the surface of our sphere is still totally flat. We haven't actually changed the geometry of the sphere at all, but it appears to have depth. Now, where you're going to see the uh, sort of the illusion start to break down is if you look at the edge of this object, these bricks aren't actually coming up into space. They, they're not extending past the edge of the sphere. And no matter what we do, I mean, we can crank this up as far as we want it to go. If you look at the edge of our sphere, it's not actually moving in and out. So this is something that's applied, again, as a texture, as an effect, rather than actually changing the geometry. And you can see that if you crank the height map values way, way up, you start to just get these weird shifting effects. So this is something that you can easily overuse and you know, you're going to, I mean, you're going to create something interesting, but it's not going to look very realistic. So this is an effect that's best used in moderation. And again, uh, if we go back to this material parameters under the standard shader in the documentation, there are great sections on uh, both of these things. And if we scroll way down, they have a whole section on normal maps and a whole section on height maps. And they show you some great examples of how these things can be applied. And there's a lot of detail about what's going on and some best practices and examples showing you these effects in scene, uh, how they affect the specular, for instance. So I definitely encourage you to go through and read some of this on your own. And again, I'm going to get rid of these and we're going to sort of return our material to a more default state. And the next thing on our list is uh, occlusion. And occlusion um, is a, a somewhat more advanced topic, and we're actually going to cover it a little later in the semester. It's not something that you really need to use for right now. Um, it does make things look better in your scene, but it's certainly not required. So we'll get to that a little bit later in the semester, and then you'll understand what this occlusion map actually means. So we're going to skip over to emission. And emission is um, uh, self-illumination. 
So this goes back to the example of having a um, alarm clock, for instance. Even if you have no lights in your room, you can still see the numbers on the alarm clock. And the way that we do this is by using this emission parameter. Um, and so what I can do is right now it's set to zero, meaning no emission is applied. I'm going to go ahead and set this to a value of, I don't know, 0.1. And all of a sudden you're going to see that new controls appear. So as an aside, when you're working with this standard shader, it's only going to give you the things that you need. It's going to try and remove any pieces that you're not using so that your scene renders faster, so that it's more efficient. But as soon as we add some emission, then we get these new parameters. And one of them is the emission color. And we can set this to red. And I'm actually going to set this to a value of 1 to show you what's going on. But um, basically, emission is something that gets added to the lighting. So an object is going to be lit normally, but then with emission, it's self-illuminating. It's lighting itself. And so, of course, you're going to see the illumination more in the shadows than you are on sides that are already blasted by light. The site is already as bright as it's going to get, basically. And with emission, again, we can have both a color, and that's going to be a tint applied to our emission, uh, and we can also apply a map. So here is the, uh, the bricks diffuse that I've applied. And so we can see that we can create some kind of cool effects. We can create things that look like they have a little bit of internal glow. And something else to show you is that um, the emission can actually affect other objects in the scene. So not only can we make this object look like it's glowing, but we can actually have its glow affect other objects. And that's where our cube comes into play. So if we take our cube back into the scene, right below our sphere, and I'm going to click on both the cube and the sphere, and I'm going to mark them as static. And static tells Unity that this object is not going to move. It is static, it is in place. And what that'll allow it to do is it'll go through and it'll bake some lighting information. You'll see that at the bottom. And now we'll start to see that there is a, a red glow from our sphere onto the cube. Um, now, because we have a very bright light in this scene, the effect's going to be very subtle. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that light off. And I'm also going to go back to the test material, and I'm going to remove this channel so that we're sort of at uh, full red everywhere on our sphere. And yeah, you can see that now we have this glow from this sphere being reflected off of the cube below it. And this is going to be baked in for the position of the sphere. So if I move this, it's going to start recalculating, and it's going to come up with new values. So we can place these objects anywhere we want, and they can have effects on the objects around them. And the final section that we have, and again, I'm just going to get rid of the emission, so I'm going to set this back to zero. Um, and I'm also going to get rid of the cube, and I'm going to turn um, my lighting back on. So the last thing that we have that we can set um, is this detail stuff. And there's detail here, and there's detail down here. Uh, and I'm not going to cover this part, um, but I am going to show you in the reference, because they actually have a really good section on detail stuff. Uh, I'm going to show you where you can find it. So again, we just talked about the emission stuff. Um, and you can do it for, um, you can use that effect for things like uh, computer screens, which are supposed to have glowing effects, and all other sorts of cool things in your scenes. Um, and at the very bottom here, there's a section that talks about detail maps. And in a nutshell, detail maps only appear when you get very close to an object, and they allow you to add extra detail. So if we look very close at this character, we're going to start to see her pores. And we can define, essentially, uh, maps. We can define channels for her pores, so that when we get close up, we can start to see more detail on her face. So I definitely encourage you to uh, grab a couple textures and just play around with detail maps and see what they do. So we've gone from top to bottom here. We have all of our main maps and then our secondary maps apply to this detail stuff. Now there's a, a couple more things that we need to fill in. We have this rendering mode at the top and we have this tiling and offset uh, in the middle. And we have a tiling and offset for our main maps and then a tiling and offset for essentially our detail maps. So I'm going to show you real quick what these do. They're fairly self-explanatory. But if we take our diffuse brick color and we add it back onto our object, and you know, I'll just go ahead and add our uh, normal and our bump so we make it pretty for a moment. Um, 
then if we adjust the tiling as we drag this object, um, we're going to see that the number of times that this texture repeats around the object is going to increase. So uh, since this is a repeatable texture, if I set this to a, a multiple of 1, so if I set it to 2 or 3 or 4, it's going to repeat and you're not going to see any seams. Um, and I'll set it to 4 in the Y as well, so it's not super distorted. And so now we can basically adjust the scale of the texture that's applied to our wall. So if this were going to be some huge brick sphere in space, you know, we could set this to like 30 by 30. And now we have many, many, many bricks going around it. And related to the tiling, we have the offset value. And the offset describes basically um, how we can offset, how we can move the image in X or Y. So um, oh, I'm going to set the tiling to something that, that isn't a nice round number, so say 1.5. And we're going to see a seam somewhere on our material um, where things repeat. Um, let me just change this tiling value a little bit and we should see it appear. Okay, so here's where we have our seam. And if I set the offset, then what we'll see is that basically our whole material moves over. Our texture moves over in the x direction and in the y direction. So, you know, if you had a, a texture that had a particular object and you wanted it to face in a particular direction, you can adjust the, ob the offset so that it faces the right way. And so the very last item is the rendering mode up at the top. And there's actually a video on the Unity website that describes this pretty well, um, perhaps even better than I could. So I'm just going to link you to that video and ask you to watch that instead. And that finishes our brief overview of everything that we can do with the standard shader in Unity.